Brian? Yes. Can we let's see if the people can hear us? Okay. Uh, I think we're we're good. I think we've got a connection. Okay, we've got Sam. Do you see me? Uh, I see your icon here. And why don't we see if we can uh, turn ours on over here? Okay. All right, I see you. We got we have limited wire capability here, so I'm gonna kind of turn this around to the to our guys here. I think we can do it. Everybody wave. Can you see them? Yeah, I do. So this is my AR grad class. Um, yeah, excellent. So I want to introduce uh, today. We've got Brian uh, Wassa. How do I pronounce your last name correctly? Yep, yeah, that's right. That's Wasa. right. Um, he is one of the leading experts, without question, on augmented reality law, things um, related to the law and augmented reality. Um, he's been doing this for quite some time. I'd say that you, you have to be one of the pioneers in this field, without question. Uh, and it's a real honor to have you with us here today. Um, I've seen Brian present in the past, and normally when you hear lawyers talk, you know, I kind of just like relax. And, but it's fascinating. Like, dialogue that takes place around um, what he's been up to. I would highly recommend, if you can, try to follow him on Google+. Plus. Um, I follow him, and you're kind of up to date with some of the most cutting edge uh, sort of things that are going on in uh, law and augmented reality. So it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Brian. And, uh, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to um, give us uh, your pitch. Not at all. Thank you, uh, Mark. You're doing some fantastic work in this uh, field and, and with the Play AR especially, you're really uh, pushing forward a lot of the boundaries in, in some of the ways that I've been predicting for a while and waiting for somebody to make happen and, and you're really uh, breaking some ground in that respect. So uh, I'm excited to be a part of what you're doing there. I'm sure a lot of folks in your class are um, going to participate in that revolution as well. Yes, we've got some, actually they've big, got big ideas around the room. Um, there are actually some the big ideas, and they might have some questions for you in class, so we'll, we'll see uh, how it all pans out. Cool. Well, uh, uh, unlike a lot of the people that have big ideas in the AR field, I think your class is probably equipped to actually do something about it, so that's pretty exciting. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see at the end of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so folks, I uh, appreciate you your time and your attention. I will make this um, as straightforward and conversational as possible, and as Mark suggested, by all means, um, save some questions, and um, we'll we'll have some conversation uh, following. I'll stick around for any uh, any Q and A you might have. So, uh, I've got in front of you here my Prezi that I presented to uh, not only AR groups but legal groups, industrial groups, um, that really gives a high level summary of some of the issues. What I think will probably be among the more immediate legal issues raised by the AR technology that we all know and love. Uh, and of course, this isn't uh, supposed to be comprehensive or exhaustive. Uh, the, the thing about AR is it's such a, a groundbreaking, uh, genre-creating technology that um, virtually every aspect of uh, society will be impacted by this technology at one point or another. And, and Accordingly, virtually every aspect of law uh, will have to uh, deal with the technology at one point or another, too. So that uh, not only gives a lot to talk about and gives me a lot to blog about, but it makes it impossible to summarize all in one speech. But um, what, what you see here are the ones that we're probably mo most likely to run into here in the near term. Now, I have the first portion of my materials here uh, dedicated to laying the groundwork, defining our terms for the audience. Um, this group, I, I already know, uh, doesn't need to hear this, so I will skim through it. I want you to see it, though, um, just as a overall picture of how I see the, the augmented uh, world taking shape and uh, it, an overview of the technology that I think is, is most relevant to the conversation. And I let people know that, that augmenting reality Breaking that down into its definitions means to, to, to make greater, to add to, and uh, reality being that thing that we experience with our five senses. So it really underlines the point that when we talk about AR, you know, it's easy to uh, get into just focusing on eyewear, just focusing on augmenting the visual sense. But it's important to recall also that um, 
both definitionally and in, in practice, AR technology uh, is out there that enhances all five senses. And, and sometimes the combination of those senses can be important. Uh, we have here you, examples, all of which, these, all these examples are probably there with varying degrees, but this was a, uh, a device that was proposed recently by a, actually another grad uh, group um, uh, overseas to augment the, the senses of sight and, and taste and sound uh, all, all together in one, in one device. You may also be familiar with haptic technology or uh, augmenting the sense of touch. And this company, Senseg, out of Helsinki, uh, has, has made some remarkable progress in augmenting a touch screen so that uh, the, the, the screen can feel wet or can feel uh, rocky or any sensation that the, that the manufacturer wants to replicate. And this is combined with a lot of the other uh, augmented reality technologies really um, has the capability to create a truly immersive experience. Um, but of course, we, we typically focus, and with good reason, on the visual sense because uh, studies will approximate that you know, roughly 80% of the data that we gather on a daily basis comes in through our visual sense, and that's how we, how we normally uh, look at augmenting the world around us. Now, uh, this slide illustrates the fact that AR has been around for a long time. And the, the concept is not new, it's just the capability to do something about it is not new. Um, and I will often make the joke to my local audiences here in Michigan that um, absence a, a couple of flukes this year, a couple of years ago, it takes augmented reality technology to put a winning score on the screen for the Lions. <laughs> but uh, the, this data that you see on the field here is, is really illustrative of what AR has been and what it can be. Uh, because you know, audiences are accustomed to seeing this blue line on the screen. They have been for 20 odd years now. Uh, they, you see the, the digital data reading out the, the, the downs and the yardage percentage that are left on the field. Um, and that data has gotten so complex and so um, robust and, and high quality, especially high definition TVs now, that I, I know several people who have gone to an actual football game for the first time and been disappointed that that data wasn't there <laughs> on the actual field. So children actually surprised that it wasn't there. They thought it was real this whole time. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's funny and uh, it's cute, but you know, it also shows the effectiveness of, of truly immersive experience. This is just to the television and that what people are used to experiencing. But once we have an actual immersive experience that we can walk around and participate in in the real world, then the possibility is that we will think of that as, as just as real, just as physical as any other experience. Now, this, the rest of this slide here, the rest of this portion, breaks down the, the different uh, media through which we will experience visually uh, augmented reality. Uh, that the simplest forms, of course, are webcams, which um, the earliest forms rely on these markers here, which you're starting to see creep into the mainstream, um, but also in, in kiosks. <laughs> for kids, but in, in various contexts, the shopping experience much more immersive and, and, and much more engaging for the customer. To our mobile devices, of course, we're, 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 we understand that that can be done for travel, uh, for uh, navigation purposes, and for gaming, which is what this YouTube video is meant to represent. But uh, media we don't often think of include the windshield. Uh, for example, GM working on the augmented windshield that will show you uh, the, the speed limit and the, the foggy road highlighted. Uh, Toyota and other companies working on augmenting the back uh, of the car, the back window for the passengers to experience real world gaming as they drive. And uh, again, not a new concept. We've seen this in, even in the movies. So Mission Impossible 4 had this uh, heat sensor readout on the windshield that showed pedestrians in front of the car and, and gave a warning. But of course, um, this technology won't get truly immersive until we have it up on our heads. And this, this shot is from last year's uh, Augmented World Expo, where Steve Mann showed off his, his display of 30 years of augmented eyewear. And of course, what it used to look like and, and what we think of it as now, Google Glass being the, the current darling in digital eyewear, 
uh, but really a transitional species because it doesn't actually offer truly uh, augmented experiences, at least in the way that uh, we experience it now. And of course, what we've seen, what we've thought of in the movies as AR versus uh, what it's turning out to be now. Important point, though, that, that Google is not the only one by far working on this, this eyewear. This is starting up a whole new genre of equipment that we're seeing come from all sorts of different directions until we get to the, uh, of course, the logical end of this progression, which is the augmented contact lens. You may or may not be aware that there is a, a test prototype of this device uh, a year or so ago that uh, provided a resolution of one pixel. So uh, application of, of uh, Moore's Law, I think it is, that uh, governs the uh, progress of technology. We ought to be up to HD in about three years. Again, not a new concept. We've seen this in the movies, Mission Impossible 4 again. And uh, this video, which I, wish I normally show you to like, skip over now, but if you're not familiar with this like, video, great uh, explanation, great vision of the type of an augmented, truly augmented future using uh, AR um, contact, what does it look like? And again, uh, every time I give this presentation, I have to add content to it. And this, this is a little sidebar on augmenting our reality beyond the five senses. And if you're not familiar with this uh, concept that Dacry has demonstrated at last year's AWE conference, um, it's, it's a real mind open overview of the technology. Let's take a minute to look at what an augmented society would look like. And here, we're starting to really take these concepts out of the classroom, out of the laboratory, and apply them in the real world to see how people are actually going to apply this technology. That, again, is a necessary backdrop uh, for understanding how legal issues will arise from the use of this technology. So augmented socializing, uh, we're, we're familiar with, with uh, various types of social media concepts where uh, you're using AR to float social media information over people's heads that we can then virtually interact with. Even in a dating scenario, you want to know more about the person that you're sitting there talking to, you just see it hovering over their heads. And uh, so when you get the downsides of, of social media as well, you see here from this concept photo, um, the information that's both professional and perhaps not so professional attached with this guy's face print and recognizable through an AR uh, social media app. This is an older one. You may have seen this one before, but also another picture of, of what augmented social information may look like. And what was particular, particularly interesting here is not only the, the obvious Facebook tie-ins, but uh, tie-ins to uh, particular uh, publicly accessible databases as well. So for example, the guy in the far left there, you see information hovering over his head that says registered sex offender. Now, that's information that you could probably find out about this person if you knew where he lived and typed that address into a database on a website somewhere, which would then in turn generate a, a two-dimensional map on a, on a computer desktop screen. But it's another matter entirely when that information is associated with the individual's face print and seen hovering over their head wherever they go. So we're, we're talking about new issues of, of privacy that we never have encountered before. Information that is quasi-public, but is made more intrusive by the manner in which it's displayed. And of, of course, we have products uh, aimed to kids that, that already exist. My, my kids get a kick out of this stuff, animating their, their uh, band-aids. So from people to places, uh, obviously, we can buy social media content to geographic locations as well as in this concept photo. And, and that can be done for social and, uh, and, and not so socially beneficial purposes. A lot of uh, conversation happening about criminal uses of augmented information like this and dark nets that make it uh, easy to coordinate criminal activity in this particular geographic space. Uh, probably the most useful application uh, proposed so far, at least in the travel sense, one that was recently released on the, the latest version of the Google SDK for Glass is this word lens application that uh, immediately translates uh, written text into uh, another language for travelers. We can think of that sort of information being plastered all over virtually any physical location, uh, as in this example, uh, or at practical, simple practical applications like this address display, 
Uh, it wasn't so long ago, at least it doesn't seem like to me, that I, I was delivering pizzas for a living. And I would have killed for an app like this. Uh, when, instead of trying to find the uh, address on a house in, 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 in the dark and trying to figure out where you're going. Now, uh, on, on top of just labeling addresses on particular buildings, uh, we can also use AR to enlist the public in the actual creation of buildings and cities and neighborhoods. Uh, I'm going to show on you a video here. Streets of Christchurch. The technology becomes true. What, what are we doing here? Sure, great. So this is the Earthquake AR software, and this runs on a normal Android uh, mobile phone. When I hold the phone up like this, I can see a live camera view coming from the camera on the phone. But then using the GPS and the compass on the phone, we can overlay virtual models into the real world. Gaping holes where proud buildings once stood, transformed. In front of me, of course, is the, uh, where the St. Elmo's Courts building was, but now it's just an empty site. When I look through here, as you can see, I can see a 3D model of the building as, as it used to be. Courts has been on this corner for more than 80 years. Now, using augmented reality technology, her glory is relived and reimagined. And when we uh, drag on the timeline here, we can go back and forth in time. So we can drag back to the left and we can see what it would look like 50 years ago. We can drag forward a little bit. We can see what it was like uh, the day before the quake, and then we can go forward in time and we can see what it could be like in the future. The plan, to make models from architects' impressions for every demolished building, then give the software away for free. You can use it uh, for community uh, feedback as well, so I can see the, the building on site and I can add my own comments and thoughts. I might say, well, you know, this new design is too big compared to the police station, or I don't like the colour. This team, certain Cantabrians, sick of hearing their city called shattered, We'll find a way forward. It's just going to completely change the face of the city. Oh, we've been through the red zone, there's areas that are completely wiped out. But it's a, it's a clean canvas. Okay, so if you didn't pick up on the details of this application from the video, what this was was a newscast in New Zealand, specifically in Christchurch, New Zealand, which had been leveled virtually by a series of earthquakes that happened about five or so years ago. Uh, we saw in the video there was Mark Billinghurst, probably one of the leading uh, innovators in this space and certainly in that area of the world. And what he had done was take uh, virtual representations of every building that existed in the city of Christchurch, put it into a database that was accessible for free on a mobile application. And what that did was allow um, residents to not only visualize what these buildings had looked like before they were destroyed by this earthquake, but also what they were proposed to uh, be renovated as. And so this hotel, this historic hotel, for example, was torn down and uh, users, citizens, residents of the city could all collaboratively view how it, that building was proposed to be rebuilt and even vote on it, even participate in the decision-making process using this technology. So we could look at, at proposed models and say, okay, well, I don't like the shape of this, I don't like how it blocks the light compared to this building, and instead of a, a group of architects making this decision, you have a real uh, community-based process, and that's a unique application made possible only by AR technology. Uh, a, a little less noble is the, the idea of graffiti, uh, but we've got another innovator in the space, actually, uh, there in uh, the New York area where this was uh, applied, uh, is the idea of virtual graffiti. So here you have what a particular physical wall in New York City looks like through a, an AR app. And here we have the same wall, and the same wall, and the same wall. So this is a real win-win situation. Your graffiti artists get an unlimited a uh, blank canvas to paint the wall however they want, uh, and the physical owner doesn't actually have to uh, have his wall uh, defaced because the actual wall doesn't change at all. Uh, you, you can see it there in the context of this public space, but it, it's only represented virtually rather than physically. Here, here's an interesting example of augmenting a physical place that taken from the uh, Daniel Suarez novels, Demon and Freedom TM. If you haven't read them, highly recommend them. Uh, they're not about AR per se, but AR technology plays a very important role in the plot. What happens here is uh, there's a character uh, called, uh, he, he's a 
please don't forget his actual name, but he, he gets the nickname the Burning Man because of the scene which he runs into this burning building and saves somebody or other. And it's, not to give away too much, but at some point in the, in the, the course of the book, uh, this guy dies. And so they erect a statue of him. He's a policeman. He's a hero. Uh, it looks very much like your average statue. But uh, be because he had such a cult following among this community that employed AR technology, uh, they used the technology to actually augment the statue and actually make him appear as this burning man. So you could actually see him, see his statue wreathed in flame, uh, floating uh, links to YouTube videos, user-generated tributes, and, and the like all experienced right there in that very physical place uh, dedicated to the memorial of this person. Along with the same lines, in a very much real world application, uh, it's been proposed to use uh, race sites as markers for AR displays. And I, I, I included this concept a picture in this presentation a while back because I thought this was a very interesting concept. Turns out that subsequently there's an actual company now working on making this a reality. Commerce is another place where we're going to see this technology applied in a very real and useful way. So there are already applications here in Europe that allow one user to tag the physical appearance of a product with their opinions. And so friends of that user in, within the same app uh, can look at it through the app and see those opinions actually displayed on the actual product itself. Uh, virtual try-on technology was very big for a while, not so much more in, in, anymore, and I'll uh, make uh, an explanation as to why a little later on. We, you see this example from Bushrod, where uh, this woman is sitting in front of a webcam, and the webcam recognizes her hand, and it superimposes this ring on top of her finger to, to uh, give her a chance to try it on without actually being there in the store. Same concept with clothes, really virtually any sort of product that you might want to accessorize with or any, anything that you would wear on your body could be virtually tried on using this technology. IKEA already has um, catalogs that, that show you visually how to put product together without having to use words. You can shop for it. Uh, in a catalog, this example, you can actually manipulate on the screen and cause it to make the noise that it would make uh, in real life. All uh, very much looking like what we see yeah, for the, of the commercial experience in Minority Report, where you, you have a customized experience based on your facial recognition and, and other biometrics. Gaming, I uh, don't have to explain to this group how AR can be applied to games, but it's, um, th there are all sorts of examples in, in all sorts of different spaces of the gaming world, from uh, very much physical games, like the AR pool that you see decorated there on the left, where a, a scanner com combined with an overhead projector uh, recognizes the physical location of the balls in the cue stick and projects in real time onto that table where the balls will go if they're struck by the cue in that position. Uh, all the way to the right where you see Ingress, the, uh, the very popular location-based game from Google. Uh, in the workplace, we might not think about so much as, as applying this technology, but it's going to be an avenue for uh, putting AR to real productive use, whether that's through collaboration or um, using the Internet of Things to control physical objects, such as this patent excerpt from a uh, patent owned by Google, uh, where you can look at a QR code on a garage door, for example, and uh, tell Google to, uh, through the device to open the garage door or open your fridge or uh, do whatever else is in that, inside that physical location. Uh, the, possibilities for cost savings in this in this space uh, just by uh, example of um, uh, applying this technology in the auto repair field where a, a, an auto repairman can be led to um, to the parts that he needs to repair uh, visually using his, his AR eyewear this guy of course being the, uh, the first surgeon to have used glass in the um, Hospital. Education. Uh, kids naturally gravitate towards this technology. Uh, we, we see, we've seen this in the, in the recent Kickstarter uh, offering from NACA, which takes these physical cubes and demonstrates them as uh, physical representations of different elements from the periodic chart. And then you can even combine them physically and see uh, a digital uh, representation of the reaction that, that comes from combining those two elements. If you haven't seen this, it's pretty fascinating. Again, combining the um, 
overhead sensor and display that we saw in that AR pool example to uh, of sandbox, which represents a virtual uh, cartography, a virtual three-dimensional map uh, that you normally see in two dimensions, but here you can manipulate in three dimensions uh, in real time and see the effect that it has in the landscape. So you see vegetation. Um, in a minute here, you'll see uh, water. Just pressing a button, you can estimate where uh, water would flow based on uh, certain volumes and where it would where it would reside there in the landscape. I'll skip through, not show this whole thing. We see interaction with interactive print for educational materials. Uh, this four-dimensional uh, demonstration of a, of a body of corpse where you, you can uh, virtually remove different layers of the body um, in, in order for, uh, to, to further medical education. This, uh, this particular application actually being launched to fill a real need, which was uh, a lack of corpses in a particular medical school for uh, cadavers to use in educating medical students. And this one's also from the latest game of the world. It's a real important case, not entirely obvious, but it's an industrial education. So what's the case? You did it wrong, you did it wrong. Welding mask. Looks and feels just like a real welding mask would, but there's AR technology in there. All he's holding is a, is a metal rod, and he's holding it up to a rubber mat. But the AR mask that he's wearing interprets those things as if they were real metal and real welding gun, and so and shows it very realistically what that would look like on a physical object. So he can practice his welding skills uh, in a very realistic environment without having to waste a lot of metal. So uh, thank you for for bearing with me through that overview. Uh, hopefully some of that was, was new and thought provoking to you. Um, but now I'm going to move on to the last portion of the presentation, which is uh, a discussion of legal challenges that, that come out of some of those examples. The first and most obvious is intellectual property issues. And this, I, I've given uh, standalone presentations just on this issue alone because it's, it's one of the ones that people are most interested in. Intellectual property is a spectrum of, of rights that uh, spans copyright, trademark, patent, and uh, a lesser known field called publicity rights. I'll, I'll scan each of those individually. And the most uh, obvious and the most relevant of the four being copyright, especially when it comes to augmenting the visual sense. Now, it's important to understand here that copyright uh, protects creative expression, the, the creative expression of particular ideas, not necessarily the ideas themselves. In fact, uh, ideas at standing alone are not copyrightable, but what's copyrightable is a particular creator's expression, so visual expression, written expression, audiovisual, that sort of thing. And there are five rights that uh, a copyright owner holds, and these are important to understand as we go through. Uh, one of those rights it is the right to publicly display a work. Not privately, you can look at something privately, that doesn't infringe a copyright owner's rights, but to publicly display that work is, is something that the copyright owner can control. So the question then becomes in AR, what does it mean to publicly display? Here we have an example from a real life AR app from the British Museum, and it displays historical photographs in the physical context in which they were originally taken. So here you've got a historical photograph taken on this street in London, and you're using a mobile device uh, to uh, view it in context of what that place looks like now. Now let's assume that the, uh, the picture only displays when you're in that physical context. Uh, I, I actually don't know if that's true of this particular app, but it will be uh, a lot of AR experiences going forward. And let's also assume that the museum uh, didn't think ahead and didn't get the rights to publicly display this image in that place. But perhaps their license only extends to hanging it on a museum wall. Well, that's, that's going to be a problem if you consider the display of this uh, image uh, to be a public one happening in this particular physical place. And that's, that's going to require us to update a lot of our license agreements and our typical way of, of doing these sorts of transactions to accommodate that new way of publicly displaying something. Another right that a copyright owner holds is the, uh, the ability to create a derivative work or an alternate version of their, their copyrighted work. So here, again, from the same artist who created the graffiti wall app, we have this, uh, this political statement. You, you, you walk up to this 
poster for Pirates of the Caribbean 4. You see Captain Barabosa, the pirate, and you hold uh, your mobile device up to this uh, poster, and you see before your eyes on the screen Captain Barabosa transform into the uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs, and the, the political message there being this is the real pirate. So from a copyright perspective, though, it's important to ask, well, what's happening here? Well, what's being done to the original work? Now, it's not entirely obvious because the physical poster obviously didn't change. You're not making a new work of this poster. And for this purpose, let's assume that this is a copyrighted image. Um, so just viewing uh, an image on top of your screen that's meant to be superimposed on this physical display doesn't necessarily create a new version of that physical display. But depending on how that new image was created, uh, there could have been a, a derivative of work made because you would have had to copy, make a copy, a physical di or a digital copy rather of this poster, and then use your your uh, digital tools to manipulate it into the end image um, to the point where there may have been a digital recreation and a digital alteration of that image. So it, to decide whether or not there's copyright infringement happening here uh, requires a very nuanced analysis of the software being used to create the image. We can think of all sorts of reasons why people might want to filter what we see in the real world. So I mentioned reproduction. Reproduction is a, is a third right that a copyright owner gets to control. And that happens all the time on the internet in terms of mashing things up and, and, and taking copies of things and putting them into different contexts. Uh, but let's, let's think about how that might happen using AR eyewear. So this is the first image uh, published as taken through a Google Glass headset of Charlie Rose. But let's say I'm wearing my AR headset of whatever brand that is, and, and I want to see uh, cartoon characters in my field of vision. And this one comes from an actual AR app that's out there that you can see Alvin displayed uh, in, in a physical world. And I want to program my AR eyewear to uh, have that image displayed all over the place. Is that a reproduction of that image? What are, my, what are the extent of my rights in that image to create that copy? But you know, there, it, there, there's no limit to the way that people have customized their computer desktop on their desktop wallpaper and everything else to create the environment that they want to create. There's no reason to, to believe that users of AR eyewear won't do the same thing with the physical world. So let's say I want the sun to look like it has Mickey Mouse ears every time I look at it, or the moon, or whatever else. There, there's nothing to stop me from programming my AR eyewear to do that, to take an image of Mickey Mouse ears and to superimpose it every time I look at the sun and the moon. If I want everybody I look at to look like Burger King, I can make them look like Burger King uh, just by running the, the appropriate app on my AR phone and, and, and my AR headset. And if I want to take an image of this, so that we can do that, we can hit a button, say take a picture, and now I've, I've created this mashup picture. I'm reproducing all sorts of images, and I'm doing all sorts of things with them that, uh, strictly speaking, likely exceed the, the extent that I am permitted to do so under copyright law. So we, we already have a number of legal issues that come out of mashing things up, mashing up images on, online now. Uh, to do this in the real world would make it that much more complicated. Last right that a copyright owner gets control is public performance. I mentioned public display. Public performance is the same thing for uh, something that happens in, in, in movement three dimensions. So here we have somebody who likes Nintendo 3DS so much that he tattooed a marker from the game onto his arm. And that marker, as viewed through the Nintendo 3DS, represents this dragon. So every time someone uses a 3DS to look at this guy's arm, however often that happens, uh, they're going to see this three-dimensional dragon on his arm. And that that very likely is uh, in excess of the license that this guy has uh, to use this 3DS image. But where those lines are going to be complicated. Mm -hmm. We've already seen litigation happen over tattoos that people wear in their face. There's no reason to believe that it won't happen over animated, creative AR tattoos like this. But you know, fiction is already rife with the idea of using AR to animate ourselves. You know, and we're not limited to static images on our skins, on our bodies anymore. Uh, if viewed through AR images, we turn our tattoos into mere markers, you know, we can animate our own appearance, um, and the sky's the limit on, on, on how we do that. So there's, there's absolutely no reason to believe that people won't 
be doing this as soon as they get the capability to do so. And the, and the, the limits are really bound by the imagination only. Then there's a question of, okay, there's all this copyright infringement going on. How are we going to find it? The site video that I just showed you a quick snippet of um, shows this guy wearing AR contact lenses. And, and this is a fully realized augmented world. So his AR lenses show him anything he wants to look at. He looks at the wall on his apartment studio, and he sees uh, a television screen as big as the wall. He sees all this other, these other apps running on the side of his uh, view. And every time he looks at this wall, it's this enormous display of digital information. But to everyone else, it just looks like a blank wall. So there's going to be that much more scrutiny given to the networks, to the servers uh, running these AR apps. And because of the volume of content that people will be digesting through these apps, uh, there's that much more reason to believe that companies are going to scrutinize it, looking for copyrighted information. But let's flip this around to the other side. What if Instead of uh, digging through our augmented devices to find infringement, um, the, the uh, entertainment industry gets a hold of these devices and actually uses them to regulate and prevent, proactively prevent infringement, or at least what they perceive to be infringement. Notice that says, uh, you, you will allow you to continue listening to this song on the public street for the next 30 seconds unless you make a micropayment. Uh, you, you make a micropayment, you can continue listening. If you don't, we're going to mute your volume, or at least uh, lower your volume to make it harder to hear this music playing in a public place. It's a way to monetize things that aren't currently able to be monetized. They, they can find this public performance, find every single public performance that you encounter on the street, and uh, try to monetize it. Same thing with uh, visual art. So here, this, this guy walks into a building, and or a museum or an office building, and there, there's copyrighted uh, artwork hanging on the wall. Well, the, the, your visual AR device recognizes this hardware and prevents you from, lo from the looking at it, pixelates it, unless, again, you make a micropayment. And really, I mean, if, if companies can figure out a model to actually make this work, there's no reason to suggest that uh, they won't try. There, there may need to be uh, legislation, there may need to be some sort of, of litigation of the courts to figure out the boundaries of their ability to do so. Um, but if they can get their hands on our uh, experience of the real world, there's no reason to believe that they won't do so. Trademarks. Another aspect of intellectual property law, a little bit more simple. Uh, uh, you, somebody there may recognize this image, I don't know who. Uh, but th this is, this is a, a way that trademarks in the real world can get turned on their head, basically. Uh, so you'll recognize this as being um, the, the, the use of this trademark to, to, as a basis, as a target for, for this protest app, to visualize and bring home, really bring uh, to, to life the impact of the then ongoing um, uh, BP oil spill. But, which has its own consequences. I mean, this, this is a political message, uh, very unlikely to, to uh, be actionable in any meaningful sense as, a, uh, as an infringement, because trademarks, remember, if you're not familiar, trademarks are, are logos, images, uh, symbols, words, used to represent a company's goodwill. And it tra you have trademark rights in as much as you use that image to uh, advertise yourself or to indicate the source of your, uh, of your uh, goods. So if you're driving down the road, you see a golden arch, you know that you pull into that restaurant, you'll get a Big Mac instead of a Whopper. That's what trademarks function as. Trademark owners, however, don't get the chance to completely monopolize how those images are used. Uh, if uh, a trademark word is used in a non-trademark sense or even in a descriptive sense, that's not a trademark infringement. So if I say, I pulled up to the BP gas station today, or I bought a hamburger at McDonald's, you're using that in a descriptive sense. You're not using it to advertise your own goods and services. Uh, so you're not committing trademark infringement. But where the, the, the real fuzzy line here uh, is going to arise, and this is what I, I'm telling audiences every chance I get, this is what's likely to be the, the, the first wave of, tra uh, of trademark litigation in this field, is using um, trademarks in the physical world, not so much for political expression, as in the first example, uh, but for purely commercial reasons. So if Burger King 
wants to run an app, for example, that lets you see a Burger King ad every time you look at the Golden Arches, uh, where that gets a little closer to the line. And I'm, I don't know which way that's going to come up. That's up to the courts to figure out. But we've always seen for 15 years now litigation over sponsored advertising on Google. You, you've all seen this. You type a search into Google. On the sidebar there or at the top now, you'll get advertisements that by whatever company has purchased the right to uh, sponsor that search term. So if you search for McDonald's on Google, you may very well get an ad for Burger King on the side, if in fact Burger King has purchased the rights to do so. Um, and there has been no end to lawsuits over whether or not that is a, uh, an infringement, an improper use of that trademark in commerce. Well, this is basically the same principle in three dimensions. Um, if you are looking down the road, say we're even wearing AR eyewear, and you just recognize a trademark, and you get sponsored advertising associated with that trademark, uh, that's going to make the owner of the trademark upset. Uh, and you will definitely see litigation. You know, you'll not only see that activity happening, because we've seen it in the digital space already on, on desktop computers and on mobile devices. Uh, so it's inevitable that we'll see it here using AR. You also, it's also inevitable that we're going to see litigation over that in the patent space. Now, this is where there's actually been the most litigation that's already happened uh, involving AR. And most of it uh, filed by what we affectionately call patent trolls, which are companies that don't actually do anything with the patents that they own. They just own patents for the purpose of suing other people for infringing them. Uh, and you'll remember I mentioned the, the Boutron example, uh, the virtual try-on technology, where uh, you, know, you hold up your hand to try on a ring or a watch, uh, you try on clothes. Um, very useful technology. Uh, that technology, as I mentioned, though, is almost gone from the internet now, thanks to a series of lawsuits filed by a company called Lennon Image Technology, uh, who, had, who owns a, a patent that they claim covers that, that technology, and has gone out and sued every retailer that has used it for patent infringement. The top example here is the Barbie Dream Closet. So one of the people that Lennon sued was Mattel, for using the, the virtual try-on technology for this Barbie Dream Closet app. So if you've ever had the uh, dream of seeing yourself wearing Barbie princess fashion clothes, you can do that, or at least you could, uh, through this app until it was shut down by litigation. That's an example where we've seen innovation squash and real uh, useful application of this technology uh, cut short by the means of litigation. Uh, so we, it, if you think about or are at all aware of the amount of patent infringement litigation that happens in the mobile device space now, uh, there, you'll know the type of litigation we're going to get in the AR space. You can't sell a mobile phone or any sort of mobile device nowadays uh, without getting sued for patent infringement and really without suing your competitors. The amount of litigation that happens just between Apple and Samsung and Microsoft Motorola, um, Google, they, they, they're all suing each other and all getting sued by each other over these patents. So because the concept of AR has been around already for so long, it doesn't matter that it hasn't actually been uh, commercialized yet. The, there are so many concepts, as illustrated by just a couple of examples here down at the bottom, that, of patents that already exist that cover AR interactions. Once people start commercializing them and there's money to be made through lawsuits, uh, we can expect more and more patent owners to come out of the woodwork and claim infringement. Publicity rights are um, a lesser known but, but rapidly expanding and rapidly uh, becoming more popular area of intellectual property law that governs the, uh, the right to use in a commercial way a person's own identity. So for example, uh, with, to somebody uses your face on a billboard or a celebrity's face on a billboard uh, or uses it in commercial advertising, the right of publicity controls that. Now this is, a, this is a right that's not as fully developed as the others because unlike the others, it's not a federal law. This is something that comes purely out of state law. So the, it varies, the rules in this, this right vary from state to state. Some states don't even recognize it. Uh, so it's hard to encapsulate in just one statement, one set of rules. And it used to be that only celebrities, bona fide celebrities, could claim this right. 
because they're the only ones whose identities were really worth anything in a commercial sense. Uh, to take any one of our images and throw it on a billboard or product packaging wouldn't accomplish very much because nobody knows who we are. Uh, and only celebrities work. But in today's day and age, uh, really ever since the advent of digital publishing and social media especially, uh, there are more and more arguments being made and more and more examples of uh, otherwise ordinary anonymous people uh, turning themselves into celebrities overnight and uh, finding ways to make commercial use of their own images. So uh, AR and AR related technologies make that a whole lot easier through facial recognition technology, through other means of recognizing the physical parameters of objects. This example comes from a couple years ago, a street demonstration on the streets of Madrid, I believe it was, where uh, a user stood in front of three Kinect sensors, Microsoft Kinect sensors, arranged uh, in, in, in series so that they could capture all the dimensions of this person's physical body. And you see there, it's, it was reduced to the uh, to a relatively photo accurate, um, or at least roughly accurate to the person's dimensions, uh, using a 3D printer into a little figurine right there. That, that was a couple of years ago. At this past year's AWE conference, there was one vendor showing off technology that used 60 such sensors all, all in a row to create very much photorealistic uh, images of a person in real time. Now, uh, thanks to Kickstarter, we have the structure sensor coming out, which is a, uh, a third party uh, device that you can strap onto the back of your iPad. And you can, uh, you can capture this in real time, make amazingly photorealistic uh, recreations of your physical surroundings in real time just using your iPad. Uh, we host here in my office the AR Detroit meetup group, and the structure sensor folks did a demo for us at our last meeting. And the, the accuracy and, and the immediacy of this application was just astounding. So what this means is you know, a couple years from now, not very long from now, you'll be able to walk down the street wearing your AR eyewear or whatever other AR imaging device you have, and you'll be able to not only recognize the faces of people who are, whose data are programmed in, into your software. But you'll be able to take real-time, three-dimensional images of these people walking down the street. And what, what people will do with those is really uh, is a subject for another day, but it, it, uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to figure out. So that was intellectual property. We have a few other topics uh, that I'll discuss a little bit more briefly, and then uh, we'll be open for questions. Uh, the, the first is privacy. This is an issue that uh, gets bandied about quite a bit, and there are so many different aspects to this topic um, that you know, each one of them could, could really uh, justify a whole separate presentation. As it happens, uh, I am, I'm in the process of writing a book that's going to be published next year on augmented reality law uh, for a legal publisher there in New York City. And uh, I'm, I'm actually working on the privacy chapter right now. I was working on it this morning. And it's, it's such a hard topic to, to break down because there's a lot of hype, for example, um, and there are a lot of different ways we understand privacy. Uh, privacy means different things to different people. So the first uh, example of private, quote unquote, private information that, that, that might be gathered through these devices uh, has to do with the user themselves. You know, there's, there's a lot of talk, and I'll mention it, but uh, there's been less discussion so far of how the devices will capture information about us. So here, in order to properly augment our perception of the visual world around us, you know, any sort of AR eyewear that we wear has to know where we're looking. It has to know where to put that image um, between us and where to put the digital data, rather, between us and the physical image in order to properly create the illusion of augmentation. Well, that requires the glasses to know where we're looking. And that is data that conceivably could be stored. And we talk, there's a lot of fuss now on the internet about uh, do not track legislation, you know, they, little cookies that, that remember which web pages we go to and what searches that we type into the search engine. There's no reason why uh, our, our physical uh, AR devices can't keep track of where we're looking uh, and, and uh, it aggregate that data to, to find out what is the most interesting thing to look at uh, from different users. And there are all sorts of studies done now about 
uh, where people's eyes are drawn to in a retail setting and so forth. So if, if those retailers get their hands on data of where people are looking in the real world, uh, you can bet that they'll jump all over that. And this is, of course, a parody uh, from a uh, in, in, in commercial advertisement that was on the internet last year. Um, and um, particular person's take on, on the amount of advertising that would be superimposed on our, on our view wearing digital eyewear. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, th again, the real world that we've already experienced is t tells us that a lot of this uh, software, a lot of the tools that we use on the internet for free are sponsored by advertising. So we can expect that, that you know, advertising will appear in our augmented field of vision as well. I've already used this image uh, to show that, that uh, you know, the, our, our, image, our information we get through AR devices won't strictly be limited to um, useful uh, information or uh, social information. It could be all, a mix of all sorts of different things. But here, instead of calling out the, the Facebook-like comments, I want to look at specifically the credit score that's associated with this person's image. And I mentioned associating facial recognition with publicly available databases. Well, there's other databases that are only quasi publicly accessible, and again, when we put them out there in the real world on people's faces, the uh, availability of that image becomes more of a problem. I wrote a reference to Daniel Suarez's books, and in those same books, there's a scene where uh, the, uh, the lead characters using this AR eyewear are looking out in a shopping mall, and they can recognize people uh, and immediately associate all known financial information about that person. So they see hovering over their head not only their credit score, but their net worth, their, uh, their mortgage debt, everything else. And they get a real interesting insight into the people walking around them. So uh, there's a real question on, on what sort of privacy rules will uh, apply to the display of that sort of information. Again, not a, not a new concept, and people are already thinking about this, waiting for the technology to make it happen. This is another still from the MI4 movie uh, that shows people doing exactly that, recognizing um, mass groups of people using facial recognition in real time. For the time being, uh, the best solution to this problem uh, may well be self-help, you know, the, taking the actual countermeasures of hiding our face. Now, facial recognition technology has not been rolled out in, in a mass sense in the consumer uh, market yet, really only because there's no, uh, there aren't the hardware and software available to make it happen. But we know that companies out there have this technology and are sitting on the ability to use it much more effectively than they do now. Um, it's inevitable that that technology will eventually begin to leak out. And once it does, we've already seen people taking steps here to throw off those sensors. So we'll likely see measure and countermeasure happen uh, in that field, just like any other. Now, how about AR in the workplace? Now, this is this is a bit of a cheeky picture of me wearing glass. Now, uh, th and that's also um, I want to be careful with this because you know everything we've been talking about so far is is real AR technology, and for various reasons, uh, we've already mentioned the glass itself is not necessarily AR, at least in the apps that are available on it right now, and a lot of these issues that we're raising. Uh, really won't come about until we see the next generation of the OS beyond that. But uh, for better or for worse, you know, gl because glass is really breaking the barriers and, and making digital eyewear a, a topic of public conversation now, like it never has been before, uh, people tend to use it as a, a stand-in or a representation of all sorts of digital eyewear. So. Uh, Keep that in mind, this doesn't necessarily apply to just this device or even this device at all, uh, but, it, but it's a representation of what digital eyewear could accomplish. So the one thing to keep in mind here is, you know, we think a lot about the visual information that these devices can record, but the uh, audio that it records as well um, it, it could be just as important or even more. Now, the, the human ear has an amazing capability that we can't yet replicate, uh, to, to tune out background noise and only listen to the conversation or the particular noise that we want to listen to. Uh, ma machines don't have that capability. They just record everything. And so we could be recording, if we're using digital, digital devices that record sound, uh, we could be recording things that we realize we're listening to as well as background noise that we don't necessarily realize we're listening to. And of course, once that's recorded, depending on the software or devices that we're using, 
uh, that information can get backed up into the cloud and, and, and then uh, thus accessible to uh, all sorts of uh, third parties beyond ourselves. There's actually, you know, there are devices out there. This glass, for example, only has a limited battery life, so you're not going to see people walking around taking uh, constant uh, recordings all the time because they kill the battery. Um, glass is actually a, a poor example uh, for privacy issues because it's, as you saw on the picture of me wearing it, you have the light popping up and, and, and other indications that people are actually using it, so it's not very covert. Uh, there are other devices out there, though, such as this uh, wrist-worn wristband that's uh, just launched recently on Kickstarter called Capture that is meant to con constantly record everything uh, that you hear. In, in audio format, and it re-records over itself unless you take a snippet and save it, uh, but it's always recording. Uh, so that becomes even much more of a privacy concern. Uh, there's, there's an over-the-ear device called Luxie that is designed to always be recording uh, video and audio and re-recording it over itself unless you capture a, uh, a clip. So there are devices out there, even on the market now, that uh, are constantly recording like this, and we can expect there to be similar capabilities in the future. So not only what we, we listen to, but what we see. And in the workplace, you, know, you can imagine things coming in your field of vision all the time that you don't necessarily want to publish. Uh, but you, if, if you're recording what you look at, you can't necessarily control what gets recorded. So you, things that come into your field of vision, uh, whether that's confidential business information or in context that you just shouldn't be recording at all, uh, you can find yourself accidentally recording. And of course, in the workplace, there, just like everywhere else, there is already a, a vocal minority of the population that is looking forward to using digital eyewear for the purpose of experiencing uh, content that they're not allowed to look at on the uh, work computers. So that, that could interject itself into business uh, conversations in a whole new way uh, that we can't currently do on our computer laptops at work. And of course, this is, again, um, a bit, a bit of a, a, a farcical uh, representation and one that, that the glass is really ill suited for, but because glass is the poster child for these devices, uh, that's what this comic chose to uh, to tease here. So here we see the first day this, this employee wearing his, his glasses to work, everybody's excited, and the, the newness wears off, and then by day three you see people are complaining, oh, all you're doing is recording me all the time, and just staring off into space and grunting, looking at your digital information. And uh, by day four, we see the devices banned in the workplace. So we're, we're likely to see that sort of, of reaction in, in some situations here, at least at first, uh, until such time as, in the, such as in the example that I gave you earlier, uh, we see AR information being used as an indispensable tool in the workplace. Quick example here, marketing to children. Not something you automatically think of when, when we start rolling out this technology, but something that, again, has already been litigated. This, in this case comes out of a, an AR promotion that uh, the Doritos company used uh, on this particular brand of product. What they did was they put a QR code, a marker on the back of certain uh, bags, and they said, take this bag home, put it up in front of your webcam, and you will see this, this uh, concert from Link 182 um, pop out of the bag in, in three dimensions, and, and, and have this AR band concert experience. But that, that was all well and good until this, this group of public watchdogs, um, the, the same people who sue movie theaters over having too much butter in their popcorn, uh, sued Doritos for using this AR technology to promote their chips. And the, the argument here, see if you can follow this, the argument here was that the AR technology was so good, in other words, the immersive experience was so convincing that it was too much for the teenage brain to handle. And they trotted out all this, all this science and this report they put together that said, you know, teenage brains are still forming, they can't necessarily distinguish reality as well as adult brains can, and because this experience was so immersive, uh, you're, you're basically hypnotizing kids into buying fatty foods. You know, if, if they had done this AR promotion for vegetables, no one would have complained. Uh, because these people have a beef against fatty foods and, and, and high-calorie snacks, uh, they, they took issue with Doritos. I raise this because, A, it's, it's already been an issue that's been litigated, so we know that people will make these sorts of arguments. And B, it shows that we sitting in a classroom 
in, in an isolated experience like this, talking about just how the technology can be used and, and, and testing the, the, the technical uh, aspects of what we can accomplish. We can't always envision every way that, that not only our clients are going to use it, but that people are going to object to it being used. And this is one that I can, I can virtually guarantee nobody saw it coming. Uh, but once we roll this technology out into the wild, uh, there's no telling uh, what reaction we're going to get to it. A couple more topics. First is negligence. And the neg negligence is the legal term for um, somebody being legally responsible for another person hurting themselves. This is of particular relevance to you all because uh, it, ha it inter intersects with AR mostly in the field of games. Um, we've already seen one lawsuit, for example, against Google Maps where uh, a woman in Utah was following Google Maps on her mobile device, crossed the road, and got hit by a car. It was just following the, the directions that Google tell, told it to follow, and, uh, and she got hit by a car. Now, why is it into the real world, and we, we make our experiences even more augmented? Um, so at some point, the line gets fuzzy, and, and we start to ask, well, who is responsible for what? Uh, there, there is one recent case out of Seattle where uh, a person was participating in a, um, a uh, scavenger hunt game inside of a restaurant. And the, the participants, you know, they're all racing against each other. They're, they're trying to beat each other. And so they're not paying as much attention to their surroundings. Well, one, of the, one of the gamers goes inside a bathroom and slips on a wet floor. In that case, the court said, well, well not so fast. I'm not going to dismiss this lawsuit because it's possible that the restaurant might be liable in this situation. And that's because the restaurant created this artificial environment that encouraged people to act fast and thus not pay as much attention to their surroundings. Now, how that case works out depends on its particular facts. But uh, that starts to get a little bit more relevant to the AR gaming experience when we as game designers start creating these experiences and asking users to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do under constraints that they wouldn't otherwise have in the physical world. And once if we do that to a sufficient degree that we're encouraging uh, users to ignore dangers in their physical surroundings, well, there at some point becomes an argument that the, uh, the game is actually itself responsible for resulting injuries. Case in point uh, is this game called The Witness. This was actually apparently run in Germany somewhere, in, in a town in Germany. Um, and there's a YouTube video that, that promotes it. And in this YouTube video, what you see is a user going all sorts of places within this, this, um, this city, basically playing an augmented choose your own adventure game. You find a QR code in a particular place, it plays a bit of video data for you, uh, and tells you your next challenge. And if you go and you're able to find uh, the next set of uh, digital data, or the next QR code, and you make the right choices, you see certain video. If you make the wrong choices, you know, your character could die and the movie goes in a different direction. But it also shows, just to make it more exciting, I'm sure, that this user is seen climbing through abandoned buildings, uh, climbing up rickety old stairs in a parking garage, walking here, as you see at the bottom right, um, past barking guard dogs over snowy terrain, um, all of which I'm sure is sexed up a bit for YouTube purposes. But it, it conveys the point that a game like this could very well uh, ask or require users themselves in dangerous situations, places that they would not otherwise go under constraints where they might not be able to see or appreciate physical dangers around them. Uh, that is a, a personal injury lawyer's dream come true. I, I, I have spoken to actual personal injury lawyers who are just waiting for this stuff to get out into the wild so they can file lawsuits over it. Distracted driving is its own issue. We see a lot of that going on. And, you know, again, here's another slide where uh, this used to be um, a potential issue, a hypothetical that I raise with my audiences. And if you watch the, uh, the AR news feeds, you know that uh, just a couple weeks ago, a person in California was actually ticketed for driving while wearing uh, her Google Glass device. Again, I, I don't think that was all that justified of a ticket, and it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. I hope she, uh, she gets out of it. Uh, but we're already seeing that sort of thing happen in the real world. Uh, misinterpretation. Uh, with these games comes the uh, strong potential for people who aren't playing the game to misinterpret what's going on. 
Uh, we've seen in, in some of the slides I've shown and some of the ones you see here, a lot of these games that you'll play at the arcade and certainly on your AR device uh, involve shooting. Uh, first person shooter games are a, a popular genre for a reason. People enjoy playing these sorts of games. There are already examples of AR shooting games, as you see in some of these real life examples, uh, where people are running around pretending to shoot things with their digital device. So there's every reason to believe that we will see situations in which other people misinterpret the actions of those game players and, and react accordingly. Uh, just in my neck of the woods here a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a group of teenagers that were playing um, Airsoft, which if you're not familiar with that, is basically paintball with more realistic products liability. The idea of uh, these devices actually making users sick by using them. Um, and and there's, there was a recent MIT study on this point not long ago, which uh, highlighted just how difficult it is. And this is something that you all will appreciate, just how difficult it is to create a really uh, effective, immersive experience visually. Um, the, the, the rate in which our eyes move very fast, well, so even the slightest um, miscalculation, the slightest um, bit of uh, a discordance between the digital object and the physical world can throw off our eyes, throw off our, 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 our balance system, and it can, it can make some people sick. Think back to the, the movie Blair Witch Project, when, when that sort of shaky cam uh, experience first got popular in the movie theaters. There, there's always a, a, a minority of people that get made sick by that experience. So if we're not careful in the way we augment people's reality, visually speaking, uh, we're, we're, there are going to be some people that we throw off uh, by, by not doing it um, well enough. So that is my presentation. Um, you can find me online. I've got, had my uh, Twitter account up there, a blog. Um, I have an ebook on these on these topics that you can download uh, for further reading. And these are the different places you can find me online. Thank you very much. Wow, that was pretty incredible. Wow, Brian, that was an incredible collection of information. I can't begin to thank you enough. Um, a bunch of it I did not know myself. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, I'm just going to go quickly back to your last topic, speaking about sort of the motion sickness. Uh, when I was doing my thesis MFA, I set up a, um, a stereoscopic setup, and I was violently sick. Like, it was like being tortured. Um, I was throwing up. I had a headache, like a, a migraine pounding. And it was because I was looking at trying to set up these two projectors for maybe about 15 minutes or something. So that was just kind of one point to kind of bring up. So yeah, they have to kind of take that seriously. Guys, do we have any questions um, going around the room? Anybody? Um, yes. So, Samir. Oh, no joke. Um, so have there been any cases of um, where companies have wanted to protect their augmented trademark, like um, like with BP where we put the smokestack over the BP logo, has there been anything like that where the company actually fought back and tried to sue someone? Okay, so let me know if I'm hearing the question correctly. Is, have there been any cases where um, companies have actually tried to protect their trademark in the augmented space? Yes, that's right. Okay. I'm not actually aware of any. And that probably is owing only to the fact that there's not a lot of trademark usage in that space yet. So when I talk about those issues, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward. But um, the amount of litigation that happens now over use of trademarks on the internet, um, and even, even on mobile devices, um, is such that as soon as you see a commercially viable app that starts using trademarks in the augmented space, uh, litigation is sure to follow. Uh, just to quickly follow up on that, um, I know we've had some online conversations before, and, and this is sort of what I was actually talking to you about. I have an idea that I think would make lots and lots and lots of money. Um, the question would be, if you were to use a tracking marker, and this would definitely be blurring the lines. This is getting closer to your Burger King example with the, uh, like the king on top of the golden arches. Um, if you were to only track part of the golden arches, so you were clearly not tracking the golden arches, what if it was a piece which could be, would you think the, the trademark owners would then start kind of patenting every piece, or trademarking every piece of their logo? Um, do you think, I mean, we were kind of looking at it in a way that we could take pieces of the image and um, 
putting it back together. So you were clearly not taking the trademark, but you were getting it. It could be something else. What if it, it, it could have been an image that would overlay something else and uh, equal the same, another kind of entity? Um. Well, I'm, I need to be careful on a couple levels. I know you're recording me, so uh, <laughs> I need to be careful not of course, to uh, of course. give advice per se. But um, there, there will be ways to dance around the edges, I'm sure. And um, even, even you know, your uh, BP example is a way to use a trademark, uh, but not necessarily in a trademark way. Um, and so not necessarily in a way that, um, that is actionable. But you know, talk talking about only recognizing portions of, of trademarks. Here it's... I, I, I think the difficulty of it, again, I don't know the exact parameters, I don't know, um, you know, which side of the line you end up falling on, but the, the, the difficulty is that the trademarks don't necessarily look at the uh, actual artistic logo, uh, the, the, the artistic quality or the substantial portion that you're using, like you'd see in a copyright analysis, you know, if this were a copyright analysis, like the uh, the movie poster example I gave, for example, mm. you know, they're going to look at well, how much data from that image was actually copied, reproduced in the app software itself, uh, how much was uh, was a new creation that's just merely superimposed. You know, how much it, it, there's a qualitative analysis on how much expression was borrowed from the original. You don't necessarily see that in, in the trademark context. Um, you the courts will instead look to see. Um, the effect of what you're doing, or the the, the quality of, of the action that you're taking, and if you were using that trademark in a commercial sense, if you're if you're using it to um, as as a symbol of the company to whom that trademark is associated, um, how much you take of it isn't necessarily um, going to be determinative. It's it's really if you're using that image that trademark to talk about or to compete with uh, the owner of that trademark, um, that, that pretty much answers the question regardless of how much of it you're reading. Ah, uh, um, okay. Again, that's, that, that's a very abstract answer, but that's probably as close as I can come. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was uh, great. Anybody else? Why don't you stand up and maybe walk over to the, the camera so you can see you for a sec. Sure. Aditya, this is one of our star students. Come over. Come on. Uh, uh, just you think he's in front of the okay, right. yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, let's say you create some kind of content using augmented reality software. So who gets sued? The person who makes the software or the person who uses it to you know, uh, create content that violates some kind of copyright uh, uh, of some movie poster or something? Okay, so, so the question is, you, you create a tool uh, that other people then come and, and use to create copyright provisions. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, generally speaking, uh, and of course I can only answer the answer, but generally speaking, the person who's actually doing the infringing is the one who's on the hook, and not necessarily the person who created the tool. Um, and in that sense, uh, there's, there's a decision that the Supreme Court made Oh, 30 years ago now, it's hard to believe it's been that long, um, having to do with the very first VCRs. Somebody actually sued Sony over its Betamax VCR, the first one to really make it big on the market, and, and said that the this VCR is so obviously designed for the purpose of infringing copyrights that it really has no other practical purpose, and so Sony should be uh, responsible for all those infringements. Well, the court disagreed with that. Said it, it, it's by itself. It, it's just a device. It can be used for good purposes and bad. So you really have to go after the individual who's who's doing the infringement. Now, there are limits to that. Uh, and uh, another example comes from a much more recent Supreme Court case, which revisited that case, the Betamax case. And this one involved uh, Grokster, the the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service. And in that case, Grokster itself was actually held liable. So their, their software 
the way that they distributed it, the way that they um, operated that software, it was the court held, you know, obvious that they actually were both aware of the, the infringement that was going on and they were actively helping it happen. They were actively uh, perpetuating that, that infringement. So they were, they were held liable. But you have to go pretty far. Uh, you have to be a lot more like Grokster than like a VCR to be liable yourself. Okay. Anybody else? You can see yourself in the camera here. Oh, you can, yeah, you can stand out here. You can see yourself as you. All right, so you mentioned it in the presentation once the site video. You also wrote a blog post about it before, about how you're hoping that's not the future of AR because it's kind of creepy and deceptive. So I'm wondering uh, what your views are on it going forward, especially since not everyone's wearing AR quite yet. Uh, like, who do you think is going to handle that? Is it going to be on the device manufacturers to have like a symbol showing whenever they're recording, or is it going to be uh, on legislators to kind of handle uh, privacy concerns and stuff going forward? Mm. Well, I think it's going to be a lot like it is now, which is that it's on a little bit of everybody, and nobody nobody really knows what the rules are. Um, there, there is a a concept called the common law. And that this is this it's kind of a hard thing to summarize in 30 seconds. Um, but you know, when you bring a lawsuit uh, against somebody uh, for violating any number of rights, the, that the right to recover for that action can be based on an actual law, a statute passed by a Congress or a legislature, or it can be based on the common law, which is um, it's judge-made law, but it's basically based on precedents from previous cases and principles out of those precedents. Um, that, a lot of our invasion of privacy law comes from the common law. So if I am, you know, somebody accuses me of, of recording you in a private setting um, in a way that you know, invades your privacy, uh, there, are, there are statutes that govern that sort of thing. It's called eavesdropping, uh, a word you've heard, and, and you know colloquially what it means, but in the legal sense, you know, there, are a lot, there are a number of statutes that define eavesdropping as uh, recording, making a recording, sometimes audio, sometimes video, of a person in a situation where they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and there, there are common law causes of action for uh, invading uh, someone's um, uh, from the state, state Supreme Court again before it was over. That's in total of eight years, and I don't want to tell you how much it cost it to litigate. And the core issue in this case was uh, whether the video cameras, the handheld video cameras that were used to record the plaintiffs were visible or not. So there's a lot of argument about you know whether the little red light was on at the top, a lot of argument about whether they were using big over-the-shoulder cameras or little handheld cameras, uh, a lot of parsing of individual frames of the video to try and catch reflections in the mirror. I mean, a lot of really detailed factual analysis just to figure out what